and I'm going to get started. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. This is January 26, 2014. Um, there's my email address if anybody needs to get me. Um, I'm independent of HGSI, but I call myself the High Growth Stock or HGSI Doc. Um, 12.30 p.m., as you can see on Sunday, uh, long before the market opens. And this is probably going to be a, a fairly interesting night watching what the futures do. And we'll, I'll make some comments about that. I'm going to start, as usual, with a short presentation, I'll point out some of the things that I think are going on. I'll let you know there's going to be a, in the, I'm going to do a live session tomorrow morning as the market opens. I think it'll be an <coughs> interesting session. I'll put it mildly to say that. Um, one last thing, I, I record these in um, various resolutions. Um, the most common resolution, if I if you just look at the Best Buy ad, um, the most com common resolution that I see in the market is um, like 1920 by 1080. And um, I'm realizing that for um, for many folks, um, they probably have lower resolution computers than that. Unfortunately, um, I've now moved to higher resolution computers. And they use quad HD. And what I'm finding is that if you have less than a HD computer monitor, the 1080p to the 1920 by 1080, which is now the new standard, it's going to be tough to read. Uh, I'm probably going to switch off this machine into one of my newer machines with higher resolution. I'll certainly be using it tomorrow. So if you have an older computer, um, either get an external monitor that has um, higher resolution, or uh, I apologize in advance, maybe it'll be usable on your YouTube. Uh, but I know that the, the WMV file is going to look tough on less than a uh, 1080p computer going forward. But I need it for the speed and the memory that I don't have on this one. So without further ado, welcome again. Disclaimer, this is for education purposes only. I'm a doctor, not a broker. Most physicians lose money with their investments, and I'm not affiliated with any software vendor or trading company. Anything I demonstrate are tools that I pay for myself. Um, as I mentioned, I am going to be doing a program Monday morning live in the market. Um, I know that George sent out to various lists um, invites, um, and there's over 50 people signed up. Um, but um, feel free to join us. There is the, uh, the link, and I'll leave it on there for a second, although uh, since this is being recorded, all you got to do is stop the recording. Um, while you're doing that, um, you know, it's kind of nice living down here in South Florida where I'm going to be going swimming after I get done um, in our pool, and I know it's pretty cold up north, so I um, hope everybody gets through the next couple days where it's going to go down below zero, where I used to live in Columbus, where I have a place in New York, et cetera. Not gloating at all, guys, sort of. Um, you all know I've got this big meeting coming in February. Um, we're at a point now where I'm calling it sold out. If I've talked with you already and I'm just waiting for your check, you're probably fine. If you're unsure that I got your check because you haven't heard anything from me, please email me. Um, everybody else will get another email this weekend with sort of an update. It's going to be a great meeting. So since you are missing out on mine, um, you're not missing out on George's and Ian's meeting, or George, Ron and Ian's meeting, where George and I will probably both be speaking at, although it'll be Ron and Ian's meeting, um, March 29th through 31st. Um, I've been going to these for a decade or more. I've known Ian for over 20. Um, because of him, I've made a lot of money, and um, he still remains a, a just an incredible resource and teacher. And I highly urge people to come. We don't know how many more of these we have. Um, last one was so great, they decided to hold another. Uh, despite the fact that I think Ian is um, getting closer and closer to that point where he's going to shut down these meetings. Um, I always have this slide up, but I want to point some new additions here. And so one of the things I learned from Ian was the be your own guru, meaning to me it meant don't rely on any single person, rely only upon yourself. Go out and study, read, attend meetings, and then put together what makes sense for you. Become your own guru, become your own market wizard. So these are a lot of the folks that I've paid attention to, Ian and Ron, Alexander Elder, O'Neill, Morales and Catcher, both of their books, Anthark for Money Management, Bigelow for Candlesticks, Pascal Willane for Institutional Volume, 
Ron Gronke, if you are interested in generating income from corporate calls and naked puts, pretty convincing that you can generate 10% twice a year, um, which isn't a bad way to cover your expenses, a lot better than relying on uh, Social Security. A couple of additions. Anna Cooling, um, probably more of a Forex and futures trader than a stock trader, but really a brilliant analysis on volume, uh, volume price analysis, similar to the VSA um, that Ron has been getting into, and Ron's also a very um, close follower of Anna's work. Anna actually spoke via the Internet, which I thought was great, at the uh, last HGSI seminar. Um, so i out her book, which I think is as little as four bucks or so on Amazon.com. And then the last one I read, and you know, whoops, I didn't really know what to expect from Mark Mitterveni's book. What a great book. Um, it's really HGSI. Um, you know, his, his philosophy of finding great growth stocks, when to trade and when to sell them. And um, I really like the book a lot. He calls them super performers. I think last year was the, I mean, when I look at Valiant, I look at Jazz, I look at Celgene, I look at United Rentals, those are all to me super performers. Um, and he talks a lot about how to find them and how to trade them. I highly recommend the book. Um, now, brief question for the audience. If any of you are preferred access members paying your $500 to $1,000 a month for Mark's um, signal, please email me offline. I'm very curious if it's a worthwhile thing to do. Now, of course, if he had an indicator in a software program, I'm sure I wouldn't think twice about it. Um, but I'm curious what people think if they're actually paying for it. Lots of things on my desktop. I need very few things to trade. I need a real-time trading platform, of which I use both TradeStation and Thinkorswim. I need an analysis program, which is number than HGSI. EdgeRader is a great back testing and market timing tool. Um, Magenta Trader, and then MarketSmith. Um, I'm starting to wonder whether or not I bring VectorVest back onto my list. I, I always attend their meetings in January in Tampa, kind of a way of recovering after New Year's. Um, not that I often learn anything new from the VectorVest speakers, but I also always enjoy getting to know folks in the crowd um, and learning from them. I always get a few tips that make sense. They've got a pretty phenomenal new options module coming out from Tom Joseph, who wrote Advanced Get. So we'll see. And I'll comment about that in the future. Um, this is an old slide. I think there's a couple points here. Um, I've been talking for 18 months. When are we going to fall over the cliff here and go from that stage three of, of uncertainty instead of going back up, which is what we've been done. Every time we pause, it's been a pause to refresh and a pause to refresh. And you can see that in the S&P 500 with these little sideways and, and modest pullbacks. Um, Thursday and Friday felt that we've now entered stage four, which is the markdown phase. And um, you know, the big thing about stocks that we trade and I trade, they go up like rockets, but they fall like rocks. These things come down hard. And if you have a big high growth stock portfolio, IBD 50 um, portfolio, MarketSmith 250 portfolio, you got clobbered this week. And, be interesting to see whether the futures tell us that it's a quick fall and we're going to go back up, or do we have something deeper? And you know, I guess you know, my wife made a comment at dinner that I didn't tell her the market was so bad, and I said, "Well, think about the statement: the worst week and the worst day in two years." Um, it tells you that we've had a really good two years, um, in my mind, in that um, it was a pretty profound pullback, but. This is it in the last two years. So um, I think it could be the beginning of something. Now what? We're oversold by many criteria. Um, worst week, as I said, two years. A, a large number of leading stocks were broken on high volume. The internals got trashed. And I'm kind of glad I'm doing this program Monday morning because I think it's a pretty critical time. Will we see a bounce? Will they buy the dip this time? Or is the big bear coming out of hibernation? And um, I don't know. I think I saw a lot of things that um, were ugly on my reviews. It's hard to find any leading stocks this week, I'll tell you that much. Here's things that are not so bad. These are the canaries. These are the leaders of the market. And they barely broke below the 17-day moving average. Here they are, a list of leaders trying to find early warning when this market rolls over. And they've pulled back much more in the past. So they barely started here. Now, two pocket pivots down, a big kahuna down, a DI crossover, and pullbacks on the force and in the bongos. Certainly suggests that we might be seeing more of a pullback 
and um, I'd be looking for that 50 to be support there. The LLUR is a much broader list that we picked together at the HTSI meeting, and you could see um, several of them um, are doing well. And you can see, again, similar to the Canaries, it pulled back through the 17 on its way down to the 200 and certainly a deterioration. But again, I, I mind you, in December, they also pulled back here, similar looking bars to what we had there, went sideways to the 50, caught up and ran again. And at this point, I don't think you can tell whether we're going to pull back hard and maybe work our way down to the 200 or whether we're going to bounce off that 50. Um, from a managing position, I'll make, I've made some changes in my portfolio already. If these break below the 50, I'll make even more changes. And when we get closer to the 200, I want to be um, very much short the market in cash before we even get there. So you know, one of the things that George Lee does, and if you've never heard him talk, he gets away with it too, is he likes to yell at people because he tells you what to do. And then he gets mad when no one does it. So I'm going to put my George Lee hat on. And I, when I say yell, I'm being, I'm over calling it. It's gentle. But nothing's more frustrating when you tell people some great ideas and they all shake their head and no one acts upon it. Over the last several weeks, starting as early as December 16th, and I had it in my presentation two weeks ago, I talked with you about the cyclical, the cyclical nature of, of Netflix and um, how it um, has a tendency in the late part of January around earnings to make a big move. Nine out of 10 years up, average year up 23.6. Now, um, so that told me if I was going to Vegas, that nine out of 10 times, the left, my move was, it went, moved up and it moved up 26% or 23%. So odds to me, was that Netflix would have a 20% move. And, you know, Vegas, your odds are less than 50-50. When this is 9 out of 10 times, your odds are, to me, are a lot greater than 50-50. And also, I can understand why Netflix does well in this time frame. It's because you're reporting earnings after everybody bought their smart TVs and smartphones and pads and signed up for Netflix over the fourth quarter. You can see, in, and this is Magenta, by the way, Type channel, and we're looking at this back in December. Predicted perhaps a little bit, the yellow line is the predictor line of seasonality, a pullback going into the middle of January, and then just a big rapid uptake around earnings. So how did I play that? And I actually, let me change the date here. I realized when I wrote the slide that I had the wrong date here, um, and then I kept the date by mistake. So if I remember correctly, it was the 23rd. Let's see if I get my dates right. Look at my calendar real quick. I hate when I make mistakes when I'm making a point. So bear with me a second. Because um, this is really, to me, a critical point. The, the 22nd and the 23rd. So on the 22nd was the buy date on the calls that I bought. And the 23rd is when I sold the calls. So when did earnings come out on Netflix? They came out, I believe, um, the evening of the 22nd. So let me go back to where I was. I apologize for that. Okay, so I knew that or somewhere around earnings I'd see a big pop. Now, this is not one of those inexpensive stocks, and it's not an inexpensive option. So I decided that I was going to play this by buying a weekly option that would expire in the next day or two and avoid um, you know, taking risk over the weekend or going into the trade, because I thought the market was at risk of rolling over. So George and I talked on the phone on Wednesday. And you can see it traded up on Wednesday here, up $5 at 3.33. So about an hour before the close, I'm talking to George Lee. And I was looking, and there were $15.35 at the time, 1620 at the close. So I just took the close price. So I like buying in the money or close to the money calls that have a much higher chance of finishing um, you know, at a profit or break even. 
um, but they're expensive. So I bought 20 contracts for $16.20 for an investment of $32,400. Now George, I thought bought 370s, he bought 365s, but I'm going to use the 370 example. And if I had bought an equal amount of 370s at 355, I could have bought 100 contracts. So I controlled 2,000 shares in my trade. And if I had done George's trade, I would have controlled 10,000 shares. Now, reality is these are, kind of, these are options that expire in two days. And if the stock moved against me, I would lose my $32,000. And for it to break even, it required a pretty big move. It required a, to break even for me, that had to be about $350, which would be a 16, a 5% move. Now, I predicted a 20% move, and that's why I chose those options. Now, if I was thinking about it, 20% from 333 would have gone up to 393, and George's pick would have been better, but it's a riskier pick if you, if you don't want to lose your premium. So what happened? Earnings came out. They blew away numbers. They had more subscribers than people expected. The same thing that's happened 9 out of 10 of the last year. And what happened to the stock? Traded up to 395, so it had a full 20% move. Closed on on, Friday, on Thursday at 388.72, and I just put the closing prices um, when I did the think back um, from TradeStation. I actually had a buy stop and a sell stop at $90, so I got out at a couple bucks more. But basically, had you done this trade, my trade returned $74,000 and 750 cents in one day from a $32,000 investment. And George's trade returned 152,000 from a 35,000 investment. Now, that's a lot of money. It's a big risk. Maybe a lot of people don't want to take that risk, and I get it. But when I see a nine out of ten seasonality with percentage return of 20 percent, I'm willing to take that risk. Made up for a horrible day in some of my other positions on Thursday. I'll tell you. Uh, actually, Friday was a tougher day for me. Um, there are other programs besides Magenta out there. There's Trade Miner from Gecko, and then there's Best Choice, which is sort of the granddad. Unfortunately, it still feels like the granddaddy, and the software is kind of um, old feeling, but it still works, and it has something I like better, which is this um, trade list, where I can run the whole universe of stocks, and then I can dump to Excel spreadsheets. And I could see that in their in their world, it was actually 10 and 0, it was 9 and 1 in Magenta Trader. So I'd have to go back and look at that. 100% um, wins, average profit 21.92%. What else has good in January? ESI, 13 to 0, 100% wins, 14% return. I know that George paid that. Now, interestingly, um, Solar stocks were weak this week, and you know what? What a shocker! They were. This is historically weak. You can see that J Solar, YGE, CSUN all have a hundred percent negativity this time of year, and they also are bad in February. So if you own any Jinx Solar or CSIQ or Trina Solar or JASO, you might think about taking profits now and then coming back in at when they become stronger from a seasonality perspective. Going into next month, um, Deltec, 6 to 0, huge profit. There's something funny there. Rubicon, um, Smith & Weston, looks like it's selling off now, but 12 out of 13 winners, a 13.83% return. And you can see solar stocks are weak historically. And you can see these are all zero losers, so these not a lot of years. but. Each trade was a winning trade. Some were not available for 10 or 20 years going back. So message for me, think defensive, reduce position, sell your losers, tighten your stops, raise cash, consider going short. Um, if you have positions that you don't want to trade, you might buy puts and sell some calls against them, and you might want to buy contra ETFs. That's where I'll be playing mostly. Don't miss the upcoming meeting, I already mentioned. Um, the website, highgrowstock.com, you probably know it or else you wouldn't be getting this video. Um, there's a free trial software, no credit card for 30 days, highly recommend it. 
And if you go into investing strategies and drop that down, you'll see my name, Dr. Jeffrey Scott. Of course, spelled wrong, but bygones. And you'll be able to see a list of the videos that I've done weekly for a couple of years. You could also go to YouTube and search for my initials, JAS, and then Cancer Doc, which is what I am by training. And you could find a whole host of online videos that I've posted over the last couple of years. Uh, as I mentioned, my meeting with, uh, with George is sold out. We're going to look, hopefully, at another location in four or five months and try and do one in between um, now and the next PD meeting. Um, but we'll wait and see how the meeting goes and make sure we get good feedback. Chris White, the Raider, will also be joining us. And um, it will be a nice smattering. We have some colleagues of mine from HTSI land. We have a number of people that are new to HTSI coming. Many of them are followers of George Lee. We've got people coming from Europe, Canada, the West Coast. But most of the people are coming from the Mid-Atlantic. Priority message, be your own guru. Invest in the business. Make sure the right employees, tools, and software. Your continuing education matters and trade a market we have, not the one you think we should have. So on that note, let me start closing down some things so I have more room, and let's take a look at the market. By my phone, we're at about 20 minutes, which is a little bit behind schedule, um, but there's not a lot of longs to look for today, unfortunately, so um, we'll probably make some of that time up. You know, I like to go look at Trade Station and get a sense of what the market's doing. I like to look at my elder indicators and take a look at um, what they're telling me on the impulse. Now, I've been mentioning that this hump up here on the S&P um, had a divergence compared to back here, higher high, lower high on the MACD, so losing momentum. We've been talking about a rollover, but to be honest, we've been talking about a rollover for quite some time. We got a rollover, and you can see a really deep pullback to below the lines on the S&P 500, below the envelope lines. So already oversold. You can see last time we got here, it snapped back pretty quickly. So it would be interesting to see if we get that again. If you look at the weekly, it's also red. Boy, we have to go back pretty far um, to July of 13 to even see a red comment there. And to get down to that lower envelope, we're back here to the end of 2012, probably October, November of 12. So um, still a long ways to fall on the weekly potential down to about 1,700. Um, my hope is that we don't do that and that we bounce. If I look at the, the Dow, more big stocks, more pain, a similar picture, um, a deep undercut. So how many days are we going to live here before we bounce? I don't know. You can see that you have no negative divergence. You have a lower low on the MACD and a lower low, almost a lower low on price. So MACD leading the price down, I would expect us to see further weakness there. The yes, SC yes, NASDAQ, um, a little bit less bad, I guess, because the weekly is still blue, but also got heading down towards this lower envelope. So by this indicator, perhaps another 30 or 40 points down on the NASDAQ before we bounce. Now historically, we don't usually spend a lot of time Below, uh, hold on, let me kill these things. Go to drawing, move objects, select all. Okay, we don't usually spend a lot of time below that lower band. So my hope is that we're going to bounce based upon that. But we still have some room here to pull down further on the Nasdaq. Um, when I look at my big radar screen. First thing I notice is that I look at my top stocks. There were a lot of Bible gap ups this week. Okay. On the other hand, on Friday, there's mostly red. So there was a lot of weakness in this market. You all know that. Your um, 3x bulls were predominantly red. You know, gold is going to go perhaps opposite the market right now. Treasury bonds are going. Uh, opposite of the stock market, so that's why they're green. And then you take out the treasuries and all the 3x bears um, had a great week. Now, I don't know why this is painting green, because it was down 0.23 and dust was up a little bit, so pretty much nothing going on in the gold 3x's on Friday. But you could see um, 
viable gap ups in EDZ, FAZ, MDZ, SPX, and VXX. Um, spoke a little bit about this last night with George Lee. And when you get a 20% move in a week in, um, in the VIX, is it 20%? We'll look at how much. When you get a huge move in a week, maybe it was 50%, the tendency for the VIX to, to, to signal an oversold market, you might expect to snap, snap that. But I see a lot of weak, weakness. All the sectors were down on Friday, and you could see we're not down teenies. The only one that was less than 1% down was consumer staples, and they were 0.9. Um, industrials were down 3%. Materials were down 2.68%. All right. I look at my weekend review. We'll go through this quickly. It was ugly. A um, little bit of black and a hell of a lot of yellow. S&P was down 2.63. Um, if I had held all my stocks for the week and I was selling out all week long, and my big, bad, you know, if I had left them in, the big bad day was Friday, down about 4%. But so was the IBD 50. Again, to be fair, none of these are managed lists. These are the lists from a week ago. The GF All-Stars were down 5.59. HGS 100 was down 3.5, and, and Sprinters were down 3.75. So if those numbers look like that and you're a gross stock investor, you had a lousy week. What, for what was winners, Guppy Darvis, the stocks that broke up in Guppy Darvis on Friday a week ago were 50-50, but up 2.77%. And viable gap ups um, were five out of six, five winners, six losers, but those that were winners won big. And one of my list, bottom fishing, was up 3 to 0, up 2%. No shocker, my bottom fishers were um, three gold stocks. And you can see they had a really not a great week. However, compared to the market, they were up. Now, a couple things to give me an idea of how bad this is. The Hindis. We did not fire Hindenburg Omen, which is good. Um, now, what I do see, bring this up to here, is that um, what's missing is a new high and new lows greater than 2.2%. And you can see the new highs were 0.69 and new lows were 0.1.84. Um, so we just missed it because we've been coming down. Um, so there were very few new highs. That's what saved us. And those who know that Hindenburg is sort of the, the um, professional selling out at the top to us individual investors, and it's a sign often of impending doom. The previous one was in December, and we'll see when the next one comes. From a bucketology perspective, more evidence that we're oversold. These are from EdgeRater that make my life much easier. And you can see over 30% of the stocks in the S&P 1500 are trading below their lower Bollinger Band. Since they spend 90 95% of their life between the Bollinger Bands, when they're above or they're below, they typically come back within, and you've got nearly a third of the stocks trading below. So this is a very oversold-looking picture, and the percent B below 50% to 74%, so squarely in bearish territory. The markets, again, an edge rater, looking at the multiple markets just to get a feel for what we're going in. Green is good, red is bad, and you can see you have kahunas across the board, and we're decidedly red. And so the question will be is whether this is a short period of red or going to be something that lasts for a long time. One of the things that's been a hallmark of the market over the last year is that these periods of red have not lasted more than five to seven days. So um, you know, we, I keep waiting for the big one, and that's why I said, is, it, is, it, is this the one this time? Because I don't know that answer. Um, year to date. Um, been kind of interesting performance. Uh, some of the higher moving stocks of last year, the higher ERG stocks have actually been punished and have sold off. A lot of people thought there'd be profit taking there. Um, those that were the highest, best distribution have suffered. And I think that's purely related to that profit taking of the winners from last year. If we look at last week, um, you know, some of the better stocks have started to show improvement. Some of the lower ERG stocks have been doing well. These are typically stocks that don't have money yet. Um, high relative strength stocks, though, did it overall get clobbered this week. And again, didn't matter what group you were in, you did poorly. So that's the last seven days. The other one was year to date. Uh, thank you to Chris 
at Edge Raider for um, making this so damn easy on me. Next, I'd like to go into HGSI and take a quick look at some of the major market indices. I realize there's a little bit of a delay because um, I have a second machine going. Um, it's kind of frustrating because as the person driving, it's, you know, I don't know how much your delay is. So let's go down to user groups, Woodward and Brown, Major Markets Plus, top down, top down gives me multiple weeks, heavier on the most recent week, um, all technical factors, price and volume related. And what do we see um, down on the bottom are stock markets, small stocks got hammered. NYC has a lot of small stocks, S&P 600, the Russell, NASDAQ did poorly. Um, Dow Jones Utilities, NASDAQ 100, Semis, and S&P 100 did a little bit better. Um, the leaders are bonds, gold, oil, volatility, and we're going to look at each of these. If you look at five-day performance, volatility is up nearly 50%. I think that's what, what George pointed out to me is when the VIX moves 50%, it typically signals time to buy. So we're close to that point. <laughs> and frankly, if the market opens down tomorrow morning, um, probably a high likelihood we're going to trigger that. And um, perhaps we'll see a rebound um, later in the day. Oil, gas up almost 3%. Gold did not have a great week. It was up 2%. You look at the NYC was down 3.3. Dow was down 3.3. SP 1500 was down 3 over the last five days. Um, and since Monday was a holiday, that would be going back to the prior Friday. If we look, again, let's take a look at some of these. Let's start with the S&P 500. And they're all going to look like this. They're all showing, let me give you a little bit more here. I like going back to the, my base low, which would be right here, um, 1380, um, ish, 1350, whatever this bar was here. The low on that day was 1343. You had the bingos, and then you had the reversal day there with the morning star gap up the following day, and off of that green candle low, we went to the races. So the question is, is this just another one of the many that we've had, or is it different this time and we don't bounce from here? And this 65-day exponential on a lot of major stocks has also been a nice place to pull back to. Um, my concern is that we've got this area here. you got really, you got no moving averages to support me staying and falling here. Um, you'll have some areas of support probably there, maybe some more support around here. But I think that there's not a lot of um, support if we continue to sell off until we get back down to this rising 200-day um, moving average. So that could be a pretty, that's another 90 points under 5% that will get us to about an 8% correction. And maybe that's where we should put our target. And as we start to look at things we could do based upon that, use that number. Kahuna down, my momentum indicator is going negative. No question that was a weak day. Now I can look at the NASDAQ. Look familiar? Talk a pivot down because it's got volume. Everything else is the same, just a horrible day. If I look at the um, NYC composite, harder to see, but it broke down below the 50. It's trading down to here. Everything is red with a couple of bad kahunas. <laughs> if I look at the Russell 2000, No values and no kahunas, but right up here, pulling back to the, above the 50. So you could see a bounce here, as you've seen so many times. So again, when are we not going to be like all the others? And are we going to be more like here, 
when we broke back in 2008, obviously it was a black swan event, but we broke down and we were below that 200-day moving average from October of 08 until May, June of 09. So that's the scary one is, you know, do we hold these net moving averages or do we bounce? You can see going in 07, kept bouncing off the 50. So we knifed through and did not bounce here. Bounced, but failed, and then it became resistance until we broke above it in 09. So that's what my fear is. What was working this week? Let's take a look at volatility. So the whack-a-mole has tucked its head up to the point where we sometimes start to see reversals. So, you know, it's had these sharp increases, and each time it's had them, it's been batted down. And, you know, you had a couple of kahunas, big move up, um, out of a volatility squeeze this time, but that's not the only time that's happened. There was an out of a volatility squeeze. So the question is how much farther does this go? Um, based upon recent history, it's going to get whacked down. And when it starts to fall, the market's going to recover. But it could be different this time. Gold, you know, my problem with gold, as I've said over and over again, is it's been a downtrend, and it's got to get above that 200 before I'm excited. Um, I did, like many of you, start to nibble as it broke above the 50. You had a po couple of pocket pivots in the big kahuna. Everything is green. Still looks extremely bullish. I still got to get above that 200 before I'm a believer. Oil off its low, still got to get above the 200, but moved up a little bit this week, which is probably bad for the airlines. The dollar, and I have no idea what the dollar is going to do. There's so many counter currents improving in the U.S., weakening of the world, tightening. Um, you can see the dollar really came down a little bit, um, not a big difference, a couple percent for the week. And silver looks a lot like gold, just not as good. Struggling to stay above its, its blue 50-day moving average. So market's certainly under pressure, volatility up, time to be a little bit cautious and play decent. Um, I want to look for potential longs and shorts. I'm going to go to industry groups. You see I have 145. And um, if I look at force up one, you can see I've got three groups. So this is as low as it gets. Perhaps itself is a sign of a bottom. Only three groups exerting positive force to get onto the list this week. Gold. So. I mean, I think most of us have gotten into some gold and silver stocks because of the concern of the uh, increased volatility and the fact that they might be at long-term bottoms. Um, questions are which ones. I have gotten into A and B a few weeks ago, which I talked about. Um, just look at a couple of these real quickly. Part of the reasons why I'm switching computers is there's really nothing quick on this computer. It's older. So here's Anglico Eagle Mines, AEM. If I remember correctly, they have gold, silver, nickel, and a number of other things. Broke above that 200 pocket pivots on the last couple of days. Everything is green. Makes money, although earnings per share growth kind of tepid of late. So that one looks interesting. This is Gold Corp. You know, a little bit behind, hasn't gotten above the 200. Everything is green. Did have a red candle high, which is worrisome kind of. I think, you know, the gold is, not, is strong for everything else, but doesn't look like robust strength. Ashe Ashanti um, getting up to that 200. So I think the gold stocks look a lot like GLD. Now, you can play your own story, look at juniors and seniors, um, and pick yours, um, and I think they're all to some extent, are going to behave similarly to the price of gold. Home entertainment software, kind of an interesting one. So these are the video games. So these are, this is a Chinese one in Shanda. If I remember correctly, they got pretty impressive earnings for share growth. Boy, it was a tough week, though, to own Chinese shares. So they obviously must have had some good news that propelled them. Um, $5 stock, 
got some earnings per share in a cheap stock. I don't know about this quarter. I think when I looked at markets, that they had earnings for that. Um, so it's been in a sort of a deep pullback and broke out with volume. That's, you know, it's an interesting pattern. Went sideways with very little volume. And then the last five or six days, huge volume has come into the stock at Kahuna. And looks like it wants to break out and go higher. Take two interactives. I guess these are the Grand Theft Auto folks, if I'm correct on that. Um, sideways motion, move off of the 200, then off the 50. Um, also had some volume come in. Everything turned green. Huge earnings for this quarter. And then a fall off. I probably want to know more about that. Probably a new game um, came out. Don't know anything about Real Inc. But sort of a bottom fish. But off the 50, two kahunas, everything is green, doesn't make money, not my kind of stock. All right, so this is the second best group. Probably tells you about the, the overall status of the market because it's not very attractive. I'm going to close off Edge Freighter. I was, I'm not sure I'm going to go to it, and I think it's probably using up some of my memory. Third group down are household products, so these are your consumer staple companies. And we'll look at both of them and see if they look interesting. Look at how red. So these things are turning around, um, but they've all been sold off hard. Yeah, they had a big day on Friday. And, you know, I guess in some ways it's a morning star with a gap down, or I guess an island reversal with a pocket pivot, but it's got a huge um, Shooting star today. I can't get excited there. Did have a DI crossover, Kahuna and volume, mostly red. Um, yeah, I guess these are the things that are going to work. These are defensive plays, 3% dividend. Kimberly Clark showed on a bunch of my lists. Um, looking at its earnings when it pops up, also makes money, but really not a lot of growth. Pulled back into its 50. Same thing, broke out on Friday with a huge, then pulled back into the open, mostly green up top in a Kahuna. That's it, folks. That's the longs for the week. So if you think there's an opportunity to play longs here, God bless you. Um, the only longs that I'm thinking about, unless the market shows me a big change, and then I got a whole shopping list, is contra ETFs. <laughs> Where's the weakness? Well, I could be obnoxious and say everywhere. This is my big memory hog, so I'm going to shut this one down, too. Ugh. Now, the interesting thing is, Forced down, there's only about 13 groups. Now, I can tell you about my portfolio, or at least the list of stocks that I had a week ago, because they've changed a lot. If those stocks got hammered on Friday, but they were having an okay week on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So it doesn't surprise me that there's not a huge number of groups here, because I think a lot of the damage was in similar growth areas. Biotech got hammered. Now, I'm going to look at the good, not just the ugly. Look at a couple of these. I think I'll probably be speeding it up now that I got rid of trade station. I have 46 minutes of, take, of my phone, so about 43 minutes. So Amgen, typical, sold off on Friday. Started to see some evidence of deterioration up here. You can't see it real well, but a high volume enough to have it with a kahuna on Friday. So Amgen sold off hard. Intercept, you know, God bless you. If you were in it down here, you're still happy campers. If you were the last one to buy, you've lost a third of your investment. Who knows what this guy's going to do? Pre-published information before it's presented is dangerous stuff. But obviously, there's a lot of um, enthusiasm. You know, it's setting up a wedge, and this thing breaks below the wedge. Even if it goes down to 120, had a big jump, a 50% on the news. 
Um, but boy, people are going to get trapped behind it. Be careful on that one if you're playing it. Biogen IDEC, um, as you can see here, it had a pocket pivot. Let me get out of that chart for a second. Big sell-off on volume on Biogen IDEC. Now, it's done this before, and it's recovered. If, I love buying Biogen IDEC off the 50-day moving average. So if you get a deep enough pullback, you might have a nice buying opportunity. Gilead doesn't look as bad, but it did sell off. Not as much giant volume. Sarepta, I don't know that guy. Don't blow 200. I don't care to know it. Um, you know, I hate to say this. If this market sells off, this may be the kind of stock that I might be shorting. If this market sells off. This stock is marked up substantially on news. It's had some drug, positive drug studies. It's got a lot of interest in future opportunity. They're building a great management team. Boy, it's had a big run-up and um, missed the rest of my indicators. <laughs> I'm spoiled. This is what my wife says. It's had a huge run-up and, you know, it's not at the highest of the high jump. It pulled off a little bit. Um, but it's pretty extended and, um, you know, from where it's at down to the high jump, 12 bucks is about 15, 16 percent. And that would not shock me to come back down here and set us up another pretty nice buying opportunity. Halzyme also sold off on Friday on big volume. These biotechs, for the most part, got clobbered. Acadia is another favorite of many of you. Broke below the 50 on with the Kahuna on Friday to just come down to the 200. It's been rising, but not a big drop off. Mankind waiting to find out about if its approval on its diabetes drug is now broken below the 200. If it doesn't get quickly above the 200, why would you want to own that stock? Um, Anacor, another one that had a big run up up to the top of the high jump bar, had a red candle high on Friday, Thursday, and sold off hard on Friday. So a lot of damage in biotech. I don't know when I'm going to buy any of these. A lot of talk on the board about two of them. Ariad, which I've talked about several times of late, and I've been in this now for a couple of weeks. I know some other people got in it even before I did. Um, what I liked so much about Ariad was that docs were still doing the heavy lifting and getting permission to use the drug even after the FDA took it off the market. Tells you about the doc's enthusiasm. So we had a couple of obvious buying points breaking above the 50 here, and then another breakout this week. There's a lot of M&A discussions. I mentioned this last week. This is probably one of my picks to get taken out this year. Why? The drugs back on the market. They own the rights U.S. and international. They have a pipeline, and they are discounted compared to their peers because of some of the concerns that the FDA did when they took the drug out. It's got a market cap of $1.6 billion. So remember that number. I might come back to it. I believe as a shareholder that if they can get it back up to the 20 range, 18 to 20, where the stock was where the drug was approved, that they, can, that some, that they, that they would take the offer. And that would mean for about $3 billion, one of the biggies can get a company with a pipeline and a marketed oncology product. So that's why I think it gets bought out. And I know a lot of people were in this one, Bio Delivery Sciences International. I don't know much about them. Um, I'm on a board of a company that actually spun this company out before I became part of them. Um, so I've never really talked about it. Um, of everything we've looked at on this week, this has got the most incredible chart because it closed at the high. It was up. My God, it was up a lot. Um, it was up 50% on Friday. Now, is this another intercept, but much lower price stock? Maybe. Um, viable gap up rules, so you might put your stocks here and only take it if it breaks, if it does a trade above the high of the day. That might be one way to trade it. Everything is green. Kahuna, volume, doesn't make money. Market cap is nothing, $358 million. 
<laughs> um, might be fun to play this one. Um, the intercept, this, I didn't look at it this way. When it traded up high, its market cap got up to the same market cap of companies like Jazz. And it's come down a lot, but its market cap is still $5.7 I think they have 24 employees. Um, interesting stories there. So biotech is weak, except for a couple of them. Home builders, no surprise, they were weak. Frankly, they've been weak the last week. I mean, last week, I was concerned about them as well. Um, and you can see they had nice little run-ups, got above the 200, and they fell back into this no man's land. This is D.H. Horton. Some people like this the most. I um, heard about that on TV. Here is Lennar, same thing, struggling to stay above the 200. Pulte, broken record. Um, 50 crossing above the 200 is kind of interesting, but struggling to stay above that had a kahuna to the down frame. So home builders clearly look weak. Oil gas exploration had a tough week despite the price of gas. Dana Darko, just give you an idea of what these guys are doing as a group. And you can see it sold off, got back up to the 50, failed, so an ice hole failure, and it's coming back down. We'll see if it comes down to the lower Bollinger Band. So. Oil gas explorations are weak, despite many of them having earnings for share growth. Talk about being out of favor. Aluminum, which was up last week, is down, was down 4.5% on Friday. Railroads down. Okay. So, kind of ugly, where am I going to find things to buy if I want to buy? And that's a big if. So I'm going to go into my reference groups, all securities, go up to my usual I use a little bit different version of this for myself, but this is the one that you would have access to under this is the Sprinters One Step Bongo. Fifty stocks. So let's take a look at these the first thing I want you to notice is that forget about accumulation distribution for a second. All green. Relative strength are all high. Group ranks are all working. ERG for the most part above 240. Nothing below 230. Um, quite a few box stocks. The highest number of boxes are the um, box seven, which are the turnaround stocks. Everything's a bongo daily. A couple are bongo weeklies, which would be more of a stock that's been in a downtrend that's trying to turn if the bongo weekly is red. If we look at where they're coming from, healthcare dominates. So as I said last time, there's a lot of places you can win with Obamacare because of volume, even though right now healthcare stocks are getting beat up. Information technology is the other big winner. Look at what industries biotech, communications equipment, life sciences, pharma, research, semi. Very narrow here compared to before. So clearly, we've got some problems in this market. If we start to look at, from the top, anything I want to look at, Texas potential buyout. Juniper, I think they had some good earnings. And you'll see Juniper has um, a nice looking chart. Um, pocket pivot. A little bit of a shooting star for me with a Bible gap up. Everything turned green. Uh, earnings beat, I believe, and this might be one to watch. Um, I'd also then like to look at what else is that's in its group. So change the index group, which is this is one of the great things about HGSI. Communications equipment, and you can see one of the ones we talked about on the board is AFOP. So Juniper's move might suggest positivity for AFOP. Now, AFOP is sort of sitting down here in a squeeze. The bands have come together. The moving averages have moved together. And it may break higher or lower, depending on earnings. So that might be something to keep an eye out for. 
Many of these made to my buy list. All right. So you can do this yourself and look at some of these. Um, Puma Biotech, and they are in the oncology space, and I'm embarrassed I don't know much more about them. But they sold off Wednesday, Thursday, Friday had a hammer, or a long-legged, um, to the downside, which to me could be a reversal sign. And these guys have been big leaders despite they don't make any money. Um, and their market cap is $3.6 billion. Um, that PDSI is cheap, 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 cheap. Easy to buy a company with that small market cap. Other thing I like to do is go into my designer and go into my smart groups. Tools, group inclusion filter. Again, if strong stocks make it to these lists, then the stocks that are in more lists are probably stronger stocks. So let's clear everything. Let's make a group. Let me make this smaller. Let's make a group from report. Dan 26 web gem. I'm going to look at 10, and I want to pick my favorites, so I'm going to go through two week high, best criteria, best woman around, best under 15, demand, erg, growth, HS leaders, QEPS, stocks groups to the upside, strong ETS, turnaround, then we go into Morales and Catcher. And I'm going to look for Bible gap ups, pocket pivots. I'm going to hit OK. And we can see what made it to our list. And we'll go look at its top 10. Synaptics has been up there for a while. Replogen, a small biotech. Quest Core, a tough biotech to buy. Van Torres, a recent takeout. Here's your Juniper. McKesson, we talked about when I did my program on Monday a couple weeks ago. Open Text, Paraxo, Atlanta, a genetics, generic company, rather. Texas Industries is a um, bio candidate. Auxilium is an interesting product company. They make money, a small, a new pharma, emerging pharma. So some of these made it to our top 10. Let's see what we got, and let's take a look at them. And then I'm going to look at my personal buy list, and then we'll say goodbye. Hard to get excited about this market um, from the upside. Then again, things have changed in the morning. I'm going to very quickly go through these. And these were the stocks that passed the group inclusion. These are typically good performing stocks. You can see Texas Industry has some type of acquisition, either whole or parts. Had a big move up on news on Friday and a bad tape. Everything is green. Uh, I don't like to play things that I don't understand. Santoris has already taken out. It's a good move, good one for me. Bruce Brotal, the others on the board who have pieces of this one. Paraxel is a clinical research organization. A lot of the big pharmas are outsourcing running trials at companies like Paraxel. Now, let me take it off this view for a second. So you can see a pullback here to 200, bounced up on Wednesday, Thursday, not much happened on Friday, good volume on a stock that's actually in an uptrend, makes money, although not great earnings per share growth, so I could see why people like this. Um, part of the reasons why stocks like this are making there, frankly, because there's not a lot of great stocks right now. Synaptics, we've talked about this before. How many people have a new notebook? I can almost assure you that your pointing device comes from Synaptics, um, or they have something to do with the pointing device, the touchpad input device. Everything is green, a viable gap up on Friday. Um, close in the lower half, which I don't like. But if the market's strong, I'd expect this one to, to go more vertical. It's had a nice uptrend, but relatively flat uptrend. Um, Replogen. We've talked about this one several times. It's a relatively inexpensive biotech and a little bit loose, but it pulls back to the 50. It runs up. So you want to be buying this on pullbacks. 
A um, bunch of kahunas last week, sold off a tad on Friday, not much, everything is green. Questcore, I said this is not an easy one to buy. Not an easy one to buy because the shorts have a tendency of killing the stock every time it runs up. And um, you can see that ran up here, the shorts got again. Um, sort of in a um, setting up some kind of a wedge, and then we'll see a descending wedge, and if it breaks below, it's all clear, or all bad, or if it break above. It'll be interesting to see. I mean, the reason why people like the stock is forget this number. It's got great fundamentals, and it makes money. There's a lot of issues about how they market their drug and off-label use and coverage, and it's very much news-driven, and I swear there are people out there that hate them, and every time their stock um, gets a run up, the shorts come out of the woodwork. Whoops, wrong way. Now, if they ever got really good news, that might mean a big short squeeze could be had. All right. Next one on my list is Lanet. Oh, I've liked this one for a while. We've talked about it several times. Pull back into the 17. Looks like it's setting up for a squeeze. If you pull back with the Bongo Daily and the, and the two-day force going red while the long ones are green, Great earnings per share growth. This is one you might want to consider if the market turns around. Open text, don't know much about this, except I wonder if they had earnings come out on Friday with a big gap up, Bible gap up, closed lower part, huge volume, big kahuna, everything is green, makes money. It might be one to take a look at. We already looked at Juniper with its Bible gap up. McKesson is a great company. It, Amerisource, and my old company, Cardinal, are all in the same business. They all are great companies. They all are amazing operators, uh, all a little bit different. McKesson sold off, ran up here when it looked like they were going to close on a European company. Then it sold off hard, and it went back up on Friday, although in a tough tape it still closed up 0.78% on an expensive stock because it looks like they're going to get that deal done. Hopefully that will pull my Cardinal stock up with it because it pulled it down when it sold off. So. Um, Let's take a look at the stocks that I found interesting and point something out. First thing I want to tell you is that I had more short stocks to short than stocks to buy when I went through my list. And stocks to short are um, stocks to me that are near highs that are starting to sell off. I don't like shorting stocks that have already dropped 80%. I'd rather buy stocks that are extended and high. And so I look through, and first thing I'll look at my buy watch. First, it's very short. The Bank Corp looked actually very interesting. You can see it was up 7.3% on Friday. Not a lot of volume, only 164,000 shares. Um, this um, traded on, on, on Friday. <coughs> So it's gone sideways, had a mobile breakout, PSAR flip, a Bible gap of everything turned green, kahuna and volume. Everything that I like in a stock hit at the same time while basing. Um, this is a regional bank. Um, most of the regional banks were weak on Friday. This one, Columbia Bank and a couple others were strong. We looked at Paraxo, we looked at Puma as a lower, as that expensive biotech I showed you earlier. Um, I don't do a lot of reef buying. I sat on a plane next to a guy that works for one of the healthcare reads, a different one. He said their biggest problem is finding things to buy. So when you, that to me is kind of interesting. So <coughs> I don't know. Is this a cup and a handle? The volume coming in and going to break out. Everything is green. Great earnings per share growth. <coughs> Pays 4.8%. And we both agreed that at least short term. Obamacare is probably going to be good for the health care REITs. Looked at Ariad. <coughs> Super microcomputers just got great earnings reports. Pulled back into the bottom of the bottom of the gap up. Um, I might be willing to play this one. Great earnings per share growth. If it trades up on Monday and I put my stop below the bottom of the Bible gap, so I'm not going to give it any room. I just think that the market's strong. This is one stock that might go much higher. 
I mentioned Oxilium as a pharma stock that I liked. And you can see it sold off like everything else on Friday, but only down to the eight-day exponential moving average. Great earnings per share coming into the stock. So this is one that's in an uptrend that's pulling back. It's a good time, I think, to be looking at weekly charts as well. And from a weekly, you know, it's pretty tough to get excited about this. But this is a stock that turn around from horrible earnings, turn around to now making money perhaps. We'll see. Probably too early. It might declining tops line, and I'm not, an, not a great drawer, but in this range. So if it gets above that point, it might be something to look at. I think that will show through on the daily as well. Yep, we did it. So that's one that I'm going to be watching. This is my watch list. DuPont Favreau's technology, don't know anything about this company, but I love its earnings per share. Pocket pivot on Friday, all green on a bad tape day. Love the earnings per share growth coming in. Then we have a bunch of these guys, a bunch of ETFs. So this is long natural gas. Gas had a huge week. Let's look at weekly on these ETFs. I might be way too... Um, late on this one, but you know it's been as high um, a year ago as 60, if not 34. The cold weather, stockpiles are coming down. Is it time to get back into natural gas? And it's late, but maybe. Ultra shorts, emerging markets. Here's a Jesse Stein dead doing nothing for a long time. You see that Kahuna came in on Friday on a weekly, broke above the 200. Why not nibble down here? Um, this is ultra short emerging markets and with the dollar going up, excuse me, the, the easing coming into the market could cause the dollar to go up, but it's also going to hurt, apparently worse than our economy, the emerging markets. Emerging markets bear three X directions. Um, same type of a pattern, broke above the 200 day, couple of Kahuna's huge volume, might be a place to play. Here's UNG, again, breaking out. Ultra Pro shares, um, this is wrong because there was a split, but the split brings the tie of the day down to where, so you still had a big gap up on Friday um, with the Kahuna on the Ultra of the Qs. Here's another Ultra Short of the Qs. You could see it doesn't look like much, but a pocket pivot and a Kahuna. I mean, obviously this is in a huge downtrend. But if this market goes into any bit of a bear, um, you probably want to be in some of these. Ultra short S&P 500. Broke above the 50, two Kuna's row volume, pocket pivots. Small cap bears, this is one of my favorites because it moves. Uh, TZA, you're buying it down at a low. Bongos, cat direction. Um, this is a play that the market's going to sell off. Um, keep in mind that... Um, these get heavily manipulated, not in a bad way, but people are in and out of them. They're not investment vehicles, they're trading vehicles. And here is CEF. This is probably more of a trading vehicle. Um, if gold and silver decide to run, this is a way of playing them. They hold physical gold and silver. They did really well in the up. They got hammered in the down. It's just another way of playing gold and silver should they be turning around. So I don't usually in my buy watch list have a contra ETFs. And I'm equal opportunity. I got bears, got S and P five hundred, got the Qs in emerging markets. And um, you know, if the if the futures look bad, I'm probably going to start loading up on these guys. If the market trades up and then starts to sell off, I will clearly be loading up on these guys. And um, there are many ways to play this again. Sell calls against your longs, catch some premium to make up for those losses. Buy puts with some of that premium to protect yourself from a black swan event. I've been less successful on that one. I usually have puts expire worthless, which is not a bad thing. Um, perhaps you should be buying contra ETFs, buying puts on cheap things that you think might be rolling over, um, going to cash all the above but get defensive, and I don't normally look at my sell list, 
Yeah, it's not my cell list. Um, but this is typical of why you would get on my cell list. Eris, when I ran, okay, if it doesn't bounce at the 17, it's going down to the 50, maybe back to the 200. High volume sell off on Friday. If it doesn't get above that eight day quickly, it's got to be, it's shorted. Trulia, I have no idea what these guys even do, but they failed at their 200, okay? It's coming down. Unless something happens quickly, everything's turning red. It failed at its 200 day moving average. Wuxi, Chinese biotech. It failed at its 50. China continues to sell off. I got 10 points down to the 200. Priceline, tough one to short. The stock always seems to win on its earnings. So if this market rolls over, this is an expensive stock. And um, you know we haven't had any deep pullbacks of the market in quite some time. But you know when the market gets weak in the past, this is something that you know if I had to raise cash, I'd be selling my Priceline shares because it's a lot of money in them. Fresnius Medical Care, um, I don't know why I put this one here. It's a red candle high at the high jump. So you got a stock at the highest it's been in months. It's extended by the high jump. It's got a red candle high at the high jump, which to me is often a time to short with a bearish engulfing pattern. Um, you know, who knows? Nuvasiv. Um, What goes breaking down here a little bit less compelling to go down the list. If anything else jumps out, I mentioned solar stocks. Um, if this isn't enough to sell your J your JKS, if it doesn't get above 30 quickly, why would I want to be in it? Solar stocks are weak in February. Solar stocks are weak in February. This sell-off here has been repeated over and over and over again. Why would I want to be there? Splunk. One of these momentum names, $80 stock, makes no money. Big down day on Friday. Um, you know, it gets below that 50. Maybe below 17. Very shocking to see it pull back down to the 50 or potentially even the 200. Stratasys, 3DDD got clobbered. This one failed at its 50. Does it run down 20 points down to the 200? Do you buy some puts on this one? So I think the point of this is here's Las Vegas Sands. They say Macau revenue is slowing. I'll believe it when I see it, but failed at the 50. It's time to start thinking about getting out of Las Vegas Sands or buy some puts or short it. LVS is weak. What about wind? Same thing. And boy, wind's an expensive stock, isn't it? stock that's earnings per share growth seems to be slowing down. Get below that 50, I take a 184 down to 152. Polaris, Arctic Cat got clobbered. Polaris broke down below the 50. Um, it's got earnings per share growth, but can it support a multiple of 26 with a falling earnings per share growth, everything turning red? Maybe you got a time to opportunity to short this. So point being, I have found a lot of stocks that were extended, that were selling off on volume. FireEye, this was a darling, IBD type stock. Is that a top? Looks like a top to me. Might be too early, doesn't make money, but you know, short term, is this going to pull back a little bit? You know. Then I have small cap. Cook. My fear is that small craps where a lot of the HSI stocks are and fall down to the 200-day moving average. Um, we're overdue. In that case, these things are going to get hurt. Is there a play there? I think my play is the TZA, frankly. So I've talked on the long side. I've talked on the short side. As I've said before, I do not consider myself an individual stock shorting expert. But what I can do is, know, is I can buy contrast, and that's what I mostly will be doing. Uh, hope you all have a safe week. Don't get killed in the market. It takes a long time to make up for your losses. And let me just put up the URL. Here's a URL for tomorrow morning, Monday morning, 9 a.m. Let's catch, capture the market open and get an idea of what we should be doing with our holdings.
I'm going to stop this. You can stop the video and write that down. Y'all have a great week. Thanks for coming. See you next time. Bye-bye.